Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see so many of you here uh, tonight. The uh, Callaway Lecture is a uh, highlight of our program here at the School of Music every week. And uh, it's going to be a terrific event tonight. The, um, but we're going to begin with a, a, a presentation. Uh, we always begin this presentation by presenting the Lady Callaway Medal. The uh, Lady Callaway Medal is awarded annually to the most outstanding Bachelor of Arts graduate in the University of Western Australia School of Music. The medal was instituted by the Callaway family in 96 to mark the occasion of Lady Callaway's 75th birthday. Family wished to recognise publicly her musical accomplishments. From the time that Sir Frank Callaway uh, began at the university in 1953, Lady Callaway had a vital interest in the university's musical development. She supported him here and internationally as they travelled to many countries through the International Society for Music Education. However, she was an outstanding musician in her own right and she had a substantial musical career. Kathleen Calloway began formal piano lessons around the age of 10 and quickly became very skilled. She was highly successful in competitions in her home country of New Zealand and established an enviable reputation for solos and accompanists. On coming to Perth, she was accompanist for the University Choral Society for 23 years. And over that period, she was also a frequently a piano soloist and a regular studio accompanist for the ABC. She also toured for the ABC in those capacities and she was the first professional harpsichordist here in Western Australia. And in the 1960s she made a return visit to New Zealand as a broadcast recyclist. It gave Valley Callaway great pleasure to uh, present the medals to the recipients right up to 2002. And it remains important to the Callaway family that she's remembered for her contributions to the musical life here in Western Australia. Tonight's uh, medal will be presented by uh, Jim Barnes on behalf of the Callaway family. The winner of the medal tonight is Neve Dell. Neve uh, is an oboe player, and um, some of us in the room were uh, had the pleasant experience, very pleasant experience, unforgettable experience of being at her recital here last year, which was a tour de force of oboe performance. Uh, she's, uh, and in fact, she was the highest um, uh, ranking uh, honours graduate last year uh, in, the, in all of the arts faculties, so across uh, music and the humanities and social sciences. Uh, she's now taking a master's degree uh, in the master's degree program at the International Ensemble Modern Academy in Germany after receiving a full merit-based scholarship. And the remarkable thing about me is that she also received a full scholarship to study at the Manhattan School of Music, so she had a choice of scholarship. <laughs> she had an impeccable, has an impeccable academic record and a growing list of, uh, of, of, of uh, performing reputation. And because me is in Germany, um, accepting the medal on her behalf this evening is Bernadette Dell. Neve was a, is a delight to work with. Um, she uh, did her first year of study here at the University of West Australia, went to Sydney to the Conservatory for a while, came back to do honours. Uh, is an incredibly accomplished musician and a wonderful uh, person to work with. So I'm very uh, pleased that she's receiving this medal. Um, and we'd like to present this medal, the Callaway, uh, Lady Callaway Medal, to Neve Dell for 26. Yeah. 
uh, in operation here in Western Australia. I believe they are the longest serving opera company with the same name for 50 years. So it's a wonderful institution. Uh, they have such a tremendous contribution to the arts in Western Australia. And we're proud to welcome um, General Manager Carolyn Chard and other members of the board here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we're so proud of our association with the uh, with, uh, West Australian Opera and we're looking forward to this MOU developing uh, our relationship in the coming years um, and finding new ways in which we can help develop young talent here in Western Australia. Uh, and so that brings us to the Callaway Lecture for this evening. Uh, we have one of Australia's most prolific and internationally recognised composers and he has a very, he's had a very diverse career so far as a composer, as a conductor and as an artistic director. He's the current artistic director of the Victorian Opera. He's the longest serving artistic director of the West Australian Opera, having served here for 15 years between 1997 and 2012. So many of you will have seen many <coughs> new productions directed uh, by Richard. He's made such a significant contribution to the development of WA Arts and to emerging musicians. He tells me that his first um, visit to the University of Western Australia was in 1970, when as part of a scheme under the Festival of uh, Perth, as was, uh, he did some composition work over in Stuart House um, with Sir Frank and um, some other people over there. So it's wonderful to have such a long-standing connection. He's also the first uh, artist to uh, present two Callaway lectures, uh, which I think says a lot about his commitment to music uh, in Australia, Western Australia, and his um, august uh, abilities. So please welcome, uh, giving the Callaway lecture for this year, uh, Richard Mills. I'd like to offer you eight little snapshots, perhaps to elucidate this theme. If this is not an academic treatise, it's meant to be a diverting little chat. Because as Joseph Conrad, the great novelist, said, the value of the sentence is in the value is in the nature of the personality with, which utters it. I stand before you as someone who's earned their living at the coal face of music. Um, I admit to being 68, nearly 69 years old. And that's you do the calculations. I've been a professional musician since the age of 20 uh, and involved in opera since about the age of 30. So um, basically in this country trying to make things happen. So it's from a very specific perspective. <coughs> someone who has the care of creation of this one uh, of creation and curation of this wonderful art form. So we're going to have a few little pictures. The first snapshot, we'll walk around Florence together. We're walk, walking around this city, which is so rich in history. So that in the, looking into the future of the art form, um, we need to look into the future of the art form by looking very carefully at its past. What is its common essence throughout the age? I think its common essence is the necessity of theatre and ritual in people's lives. Everyone, after they've been fed, and have a companion, <coughs> need some kind of spiritual and mental refreshment. We need ritual to make sense of our lives, to explore the deepest questions of existence. And in opera, that ritual has a great textural richness. The richness is of form, melos, harmony, colour, that enable us to experience transport and delight and what I call the marvellous. And it's through this mirror of history that we might also encounter a window of understanding, a window on the marvellous uh, that the art of opera is. I will now boldly assert uh, uh, that opera is Italian in its very essence. <laughs> Italian, the Italians are the mainstream. All the other national schools, the French, the Slavic, the Germanic, to some extent, the English and the American, it has to be said, are reactions to it. The Italians invented it. In the last years of the 16th century, Renaissance Italians thought of themselves as heirs of the classical world. As we walk around Florence, or look at it from the hill above in Fiesole, and see these buildings and look back in time, there's about 1,500 people there who changed the course of history. 
Palmieri de la Vita Civile in 1538 was raving on about this new age, so full of hope and promise. More gifted souls are living now than in the preceding thousand years, so extravagant claim. They saw Florence as the new Athens on the island. The 15th century treatise by Gianozzo Manetti on the dignity and excellence of man and his unique creation, uh, his unique place in, in, in creation as the spectator and the works of, or as a spectator on the works of God is fairly symptomatic of the prevailing mindset. They thought of themselves as heirs to the classical world uh, and to some also extent of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, and in reinvoking the tenets of Greek drama, its capacity for ritual and exploration of the human condition came up with this form of opera. Man for them was a measure of all things. The humanism of the 15th and 16th century was classically inspired. Human personality in its environment, flourishing or destroyed, was the central theme of Italian opera. So, how do they go about this? Well, there's a couple of words that I think are, are very important. Synthesis and sistemazione. Te sistemo io is the Italian for I'll, I'll sort you out. And it is a beginning of imposing order on chaos. Both synthesis, 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 and I've named that as and sistemazione. Um, are two important words to consider. Let's take another little walk now. We'll, we'll walk, we'll get on the train, we'll go down to Venice. And we'll stand in the choir loft at San Marco. And we'll think of the extraordinary cross currents of European musical art that um, were the basis of the extraordinary school of composition that flourished in that building. Uh, Adrian Willett, the first Kapellmeister of St. Marco was a student in the, in the Flemish countries, in the Low Countries, where this great school of polyphony of Obrecht and Ockergen uh, flourished. He brought that contrapuntal technique back to Venice. But of course, the complexity of that <coughs> was useless in St. Mark's. You couldn't hear it because of the resonance of the building. So that tradition had to be subsumed into another style of composition, which synthesized aspects of polyphony with this new idea of contrasting blocks of sound, this, the contrapuntal style, which is the foundation of the, of the late Baroque and much Venetian music for the next 150 years. It's also this notion of synthesis, very germane to Monteverdi and Cavalli. Who wrote the first opera, of course, we can dispute on for a long time. But the first one really that we remember today is, of course, L'Orfeo, which is a triumphant <coughs> synthesis of the prima and seconda pratica of the Baroque. The prima pratica was the church, the seconda pratica was instrumental and declamatory. And these two praticas were fused in a perfect union by a great synthetic genius, um, the like of which has probably never been seen again, except perhaps Bach, uh, into a dramatic utterance that was lost pretty well after its first performance and uh, only rediscovered and, and re-performed in the, in, the, in the 20th century. But allied to this capacity and need for synthesis was the need for sistemazione, to systematize, to impose order on chaos. And Stendhal, the great French novelist, who had many perspicacious things to say about music, said, about Rossini's opera Buffet, that is chaos organized and made perfect. If you, if you think of the Act One finale of Figaro, for example, or the Act One finale of L'Italiana, um, or the Act One or Act Two finale of you see exactly what I mean. A chaos on stage, stage made significantly uh, clear and audible in its wonderful human complexity uh, by the composer's ability to systematize and organize. In all of this, there were several elements, I suppose, of the operatic art that emerged as significantly important. The first of which is the primacy of song. It may seem obvious, but I think it's important to, uh, to stress that the beauty of the voice was paramount. 
Next came fluidity, uh, uh, fluidity of place, mythological subjects, and instrumental color. <coughs> and allied to all of this was the primacy of language. Because Italian was cultivated for literary and artistic purposes. The Italian of Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio, the Tuscan language, evolved from medieval Latin and the three great medieval vernaculars of um, uh, medieval Europe, the Longdoi, which was the, the northern France, the Languedoc, which was pro, uh, pro, provincial, and the Lingua di Si, which was Italian. And um, one of the interesting things was the appearance of the vocabulario in 1612 by the Accademia della Crusca. Crusca means brown, I think. Uh, yeah, brown, grey, brown. And it sifted um, uh, the language and tried to purify it, much the same way as the Académie Française uh, uh, tries to do. It's founded in France in 1583 and it's still going, amazingly. Um, the next thing that was important, <coughs> privacy of song, instrumental colour, mythological subjects, um, fluidity and fantastic, and fantastic, the fluidity and fantastic nature of, of the scenography was the connection to community. This emerged from about 1650 on, I would say. Because in all the theatres that were built gradually <coughs> throughout Italy, um, the community had a very significant place. The noble families owned the boxes. They would come and sit at them, drink wine, entertain, close the curtain if they weren't interested in the music, open it. <laughs> the banda, and the, the bandas in 19th century Italian operas were all recruited from the, the town band. As were the chorus. The chorus were essentially amateur. So it was a convivial social occasion. An opera was a sort of like a club. Amateur in many cities. Uh, the chorus provided their own costumes. And in fact, Toscanini's father, who was a tailor in Parma, uh, costumed the, cor uh, uh, the chorus, or helped co costume the chorus in the uh, Teatro Reggio. Now, interestingly enough, Toscanini Jr. Jun destroyed the system in Italy. Uh, and put opera on a much more professional footing. But it's very important to realise that opera arose in Italy as an expression of community. And I think that's something that's very important not to lose sight of in the creation of this art. We speak to and for a community. And unless the community in its aspirations are included uh, in our praxis, I think we fail and will fail to engage people to come on board with us and share the journey with us. In all of this, scenic spectacle continued to be very important. One little further little snap, snapshot. Giacomo Torelli, um, who lived from 1604 to 1678, was a famous stage engineer. He was an engineer of other things in real life, and he was fascinated by stage machinery. And uh, uh, anyone who works in the theatre will be fascinated to know that he invented uh, a, a wheel and a drum apparatus that took the place of 16 stagehands. We love him today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and he was pitched by Cardinal Richelieu uh, to go to Versailles, of course, and um, extend the practice uh, of French opera. So, if we just end this first little um, snapshot, we'll see all the elements of opera well established uh, by the mid-17th century. The song, language, modes of delivery, instrumentation, connection to the community, seeing <coughs> spectacle. But it was still, in many ways, uh, in some parts of Europe at least, earlier than this, an elite art form. Let's look at another snapshot of history to elucidate our current dilemma. Let's go to Handel's London. This was a wild and woolly place. Handel came there, uh, being allowed to leave from the Elector of Saxony, who later became George I, by the way. Uh, he started writing Italian opera. In 1711, his Rinaldo had a huge success, but divided the public. Um, there are so many echoes of these conversations. Some thought it not to English taste. Steele, of Addison and Steele, who uh, founded The Spectator, which some of us still read, um, <laughs> preferred Dick Whittington and his cat because it contained no eunuchs and was performed in our own language. <laughs> <laughs> the death of Queen Anne in 1714 and the subsequent Jacobite rebellion did opera no favours. 
No opera, there was no opera um, really until the Ronaldo closed until uh, 1720. Um, uh, the elective of Hanover, uh, George I, became, uh, uh, became or, or was the former boss of Hanover, moved to London and became king. And in 1790, he insisted the foundation of the Royal Academy of Music, established by subscription and modest royal grant. Mostly, it was founded mostly by aristocrats coughing up money. There's a thread in that. Um, <laughs> as so often, before or since, the history of the Academy reveals a group of highly experienced men of the world and competent figures, blinded by their love of opera, into acting with financial recklessness in the untenable belief that the production of opera could make them a profit. They were bankrupt, I said. <laughs> this was a bad time. The South Sea bubble burst towards the end of 1720. The South Sea Company, which is, this is amazing, um, I'll, I'll read the quote. The governor and company of merchants of Great Britain, trading to the South Seas in other parts of America and for the encouragement of fishing, was a joint stock company founded in 1711 as a public-private partnership to consolidate and reduce the cost of national debt. Can you believe it? Um, it was a huge scandal. The end of the, there were about four people jailed for insider trading, and um, uh, it was financially disastrous for the English economy. But opera, nevertheless, went on because it satisfied a need despite the civic and financial chaos. We've seen the same thing here with the GFC, and we'll see it again. People still need some sort of transport. But there were still murmurings in society. People didn't like the fact that singers were paid such high fees. You know, that today if you're a ballet dancer. <laughs> and there were some very scurrilous little verses which I entertain you. And there the English actor goes with many a hungry belly, while heaps of gold are forced, God what, on Signor Farinelli. <laughs> well, there was another one. Ladies worship Ferry, Ferry as a god, who, say some critics, rather is the rod, or scourge to lash the follies of the age and drive all sense and virtue from the stage. Now, this disquiet was a fertile ground for the appearance in 1728 of the biggest opera. And for the first time in opera, we had low-life characters, satire and parody. The English had very peculiar uh, and straight-laced views about opera. Dr. Johnson, in his famous dictionary, defined opera as an exotic and irrational entertainment. <laughs> Jonathan Swift um, uh, decried the unnatural taste for Italian music. Uh, and so there was a... The climate was right for dissension, and we find this in our own time. There are many views of the value and the necessity of high art. And it's a constant dialogue, this whole conflict between the opera and the musical. What is opera? What is musical? It's as old as the London of the 1750s, uh, of, of the 1750s, the 1720s, the 1728s. Um, Handel, of course, had, was a pretty good businessman. He died, he had a beautiful house, beautiful Georgian house, and he, he owned a Rembrandt or two. I um, mean, he was a smart cookie. Um, and he started writing oratorios, which became a kind of um, musical theatre. Uh, and how theatrical this music is, if you listen to Israel and Egypt, there was a marvellous performance on the radio from the proms the other night. It's absolutely fantastic. I mean, I, I didn't realise it was such a great work, and it is so theatrical. And these oratorios, many of them, can be staged, in fact, have Let's go to another snapshot. Ramos Versailles. Ramo uh, was, I think, um, the greatest French Baroque composer. And he was a, a very important theorist who wrote the treatise on harmony. Uh, and his music is, uh, I think, characterized by a fantastic ability to treat dissonance architecturally, to use dissonance to drive the music forward. The Sun King, Louis XIV, uh, his shadow cast all over Europe because of the magnificence of Versailles and the elaborateness of the theatrical entertainments and their totality, their um, incredible um, scenic spectacle. Uh, if you see, for example, Ramos Plate, you've got three layers. You've got earth, you've got the, the, the swamp where Plate, the little frog, lives, 
um, who becomes the abbot of Jove, who descends from the heaven. So you've got a cosmos enacted on the stage. And of course, this had a parallel uh, in real life because the princess who was about to be married to someone who was a fairly plain lady, and she took it all in, in, um, in fairly good grace. But again, you see that the mirror, if you like, the mirror of theatre examining um, uh, through its lenses uh, the complexity uh, and the dilemma of, of the human world. You see, in this spectacle, uh, a great respect for the quality of language, uh, for the musical textures, which are amazingly elaborate. Uh, and the development of ornamentation. You see, it's very interesting, the Italian Baroque is all about sonare, it's about sounding. The German Baroque is philosophical, it's bark and it's fugues, uh, it's elaborate counterpoint. And Telemann as well, a wonderful composer and very neglected. And the full <coughs> glories of Telemann are just being discovered. And, but the French Baroque is ornamentation. And, for example, the wonderful ornaments, the string ornaments, the tirade, a very rapid flux of notes um, that are so exciting to play together, uh, but are not rhythmically uh, notated, but they need great coordination. And the various kudache, bow strokes, which uh, give this music its fantastic rhetoric in performance in, in the right hands, were all part of a very complex linguistic style uh, which gave uh, this, uh, this utterance, this elevated utterance, of opera, uh, its, its lasting vitality. That's why we come back to it today. But there's a thread in this, because uh, it's impossible for anyone to write something and engage an audience for three hours in the theatre unless there is a degree of systematisation, of synthesis and of organisation, of linguistic complexity that engages the ear and the mind to unfold uh, a narrative. <coughs> Meanwhile, of course, we had Metastasio, um, whose real name was Trepassi, uh, but uh, um, you know, in the middle of the street, and it was, it was Greekified or classified to Metastasio. And he was a, a poet who had a fantastic gift for extemporization as a child, and was picked up by various people, including the famous soprano and the nurture kid. And um, he wrote many, many uh, libretti uh, for the 18th century. And his speciality was this declamatory rhetoric. Um, which became the staple of what we call opera seria, a very formal kind of operatic utterance, which was full of conventions, like the De Capo aria, repeating the aria. And of course, in the hands of a great singer, the repeat became, if you like, peeling the layers uh, off an onion. Uh, you discover new things inside the harmonic structure by the quality of the uh, ornamentation, or at least that's what we try to do. Um, it's interesting, one of his libretti, L'Olympiade, uh, uh, which was um, set by Giomelli uh, Pergolesi and somebody else. So, uh, I can't remember who just now. Um, Magenente, I think. But um, he was seminal to the development of this art form in the 18th century. And of course, there was, as in England, there was a reaction against it. Um, Gluck emerged uh, and wanted a more natural style of delivery, uh, which um, more, more closely mimicked the flux of real life. So you had again this tension of artifice versus reality. That same tension we saw before with Handel, with the Italian versus the, uh, the ballad opera. We see it in the Germany of Frederick the Great, who loved Italian opera and founded the Berliner Staatsoper, but alongside the treasures of the Italian opera, both in opera Syria and in, in Gluck, uh, then we had the, the gradual evolution of the German Singspiel, which is a kind of um, ballad opera, mm -hmm. which laid the path, if you like, for composers like Weber and Marshall. Now I'd like to look at some snapshots of change. What happened at the end of the 18th century? We had the emancipation of the composer and the emergence of the impresario um, on, in 19th century Italy. It's worth remembering that the opera industry in 19th century Italy uh, was communal, as I've said, but it was also like the Hollywood star system of today. Impresarios hired the theatre, they took risks, they sought patronage, but they still had to pay the bills uh, at the end of the day. Operas were written at extraordinary speed. 
Uh, Rossini was so pushed for time he could only put three shafts in the key signature of E major. He could be bothered writing out a fourth one. Mind you, this is a man who was writing a piece for his cat and it fell off the bed. Rather than get out of bed and pick it up, he wrote another one. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the most fascinating things of this uh, late 18th century was Da Ponte, who wrote the Libretti for the three great Mozart operas, Così, uh, Giovanni, and Monte uh, Figaro. And he fled to the USA in 1805 via revolutionary Paris, where they were busy cutting people's heads off. And he worked as a grocer and a general merchant, teaching Italian and dealing in Italian books. And in 1819, he became the first professor of Italian at Columbia College. And he was very keen to get Italian opera to America. And this is our next snapshot. Uh, the Americas. He persuaded Manuel Garcia to come to the USA and establish traditions of Italian opera. This is a most interesting development, if you like. It's, it's, we've, seen opera come, we've seen opera come to Australia and establish itself in a new continent. It did much the same in America, only on a slightly grander scale. The tradition was established by P.T. Barnum, of Barnum and Bailey, and you know, the length of any human entertainment should be related to the retaining capacities of the bladder. Um, <laughs> famous statement. He brought to Swedish soprano Jenny Lim. Um, and uh, there were many attempts to establish an opera tradition in New York, particularly. In 1847, <coughs> you see the opening of the Astor Palace Opera House, uh, which was closed by a riot. Uh, a riot of fans of two <coughs> actors, an American one whose name eludes me, and the English actor McCready. Twenty people died, and the place was full of bullet holes. Needless to say, <laughs> it lost its currency as a venue for opera. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a, a need for a new opera house. And in 1854, the New York Academy of Music was built, up the road from the Astor, and it became the home to the newly founded New York Philharmonic. Of course, the Civil War from 61 to 65 interrupted all this. Uh, opera was seen by many as elite and unpatriotic. And, uh, it and it should have died in that climate, frankly. But instead, the Met arose. And it arose basically out of envy. The pre-war aristocrats from the South owned boxes at the old Academy of Music. And they wouldn't let in the nouveau riche uh, and uh, the, uh, the victorious northern forces. Particularly one Mrs. Vanderbilt, <laughs> wife of Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt, the railroad king, who often presented himself by saying, I'm the world's richest man. <laughs> the newly wealthy wanted opera in New York. And the Met opened in 1883 with 122 boxes all bought and sustained by private families. Of course, needless to say, a rival company sprang up, as they do. Oscar Hammerstein, father of Oscar Hammerstein II, or uh, maybe not father, or probably, I don't know, uh, 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 no, probably not too old, um, <laughs> grandfather, let's say, because Oscar Hammerstein II was part of that family, definitely, um, founded the Manhattan Opera. Um, so you had this incredibly vital scene in New York a wash with money after the, after the Civil War, which had a, a really vital and uh, busy operatic scene, both in importing the current stars from Europe uh, and in uh, promoting American singers as well. And I think this tradition of civic energy uh, in um, the uh, American uh, opera business uh, has been very productive because it's led to the founding of opera in most major metropolitan centres uh, in America, uh, San Francisco, etc., Los Angeles, all sorts of surprising places, like, for example, Houston, um, and where this company, of course, has been remarkable uh, in its espousal of the new. And one of its founding tenets is the value of the joy of discovery. This has been able to garner an incredibly enthusiastic base of philanthropic support to make a, a, a very vital and interesting company, which, for example, did the first performance of John Adams Nixon in China, among other things. 
and still continues to produce new opera of quality. The Met teeters probably is the best verb, from strength to perhaps strength. It's not as easy as it was uh, because its cost structures are so enormous. It's entirely privately funded. But there's something about the pride of New York that I don't think will let it falter. However, the second company in New York, and there's been a long history of those rivalries, New York City Opera, has folded basically, basically because the Met appropriated its modus operandi um, with televising, with um, more popular repertoire, etc. and so on. So New York City Opera's had to find uh, a new voice. What is interesting linguistically in the 19th century was the evolution of musical language, uh, which was a parallel to this snapshot of change um, that we're, we're dealing with. Um, as I said before, one of the things that makes opera interesting uh, is the musical texture uh, and the ability of the composer to organise sound and uh, continue to tell the narrative, to evoke the narrative, to tell the narrative, to uh, enunciate the narrative and to amplify the narrative and to explore it um, with harmonic and melodic invention. And with Wagner, the expressive necessity of his aesthetic vision forced a linguistic revolution that changed the course of the history of music. I said there are probably three moments in the history of music that are absolutely seminal as regards change. The first is Monteverdi in the fantastic genius for synthesis and invention. The second is Wagner, and the third is the Albenberg of Wozzeck and Lulu. All of these made indelible marks on the linguistic fabric of opera. The longest piece of music before Das Rheingold was the first movement of the Eroica Symphony, which, with most conductors, takes about 20 minutes. Wagner had another challenge. Rheingold was um, two hours, just about. So he had, to keep, he had to keep it going for that long without stopping. Um, so this demanded a completely new view of the way harmony works. In the old, old system of harmony, the persistence of the remembered tonic, oh, I spoke to that was David I was trying to avoid it. <laughs> and I never had time to practice now. I said to my friend Brian Carson's son, I said, Brian, why don't you practice that? He said, why? It'll never get any better. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's the system of the remembered tonic. So, if we're going to have a sonata, we're going to start like this. want to come back to the tonic, as we might if we repeat from the first subject, and then I'm going to go back to the dominant again. And then we might have a contrasting theme. Uh, of music forever. 
Um, and I think the notion that's really important for us to curate and care for this art form, this notion is very important because when we put something on the stage, we're seeing a prism of history in anything. When we put forced on the stage or there, there or anything, all of these things are connected to it. This wonderful living tissue, the fabric of history of everything that's gone before it. And uh, it has a deep and profound meaning as an expression of, of the very best aspects of our civilization. So this linguistic change was uh, far reaching. Uh, and uh, of course, it resulted in Berg and everything that's come up, also minimalism. Um, you know, the first first 20 pages of Nixon and China is just A minor, up and down. Mm -hmm. um, but it wouldn't have been possible, in a sense, without that Wagnerian epiphany. Another little snapshot the Paris Opera, the Sal Gagnier. Debussy referred to the Gagnier as a cross between a railway station and a Turkish bath. <laughs> <laughs> All of the great Italian literature was given here Rossini, Bellini, Verdi, Halevi. Maya Beer, Albert, we don't hear much of that today. And there were three theatres operating in Paris, the Opera, the Opera Comique, and the Théâtre Italien. And of course they were correspondingly financed by the government, much like Opera Australia and Victorian Opera in, uh, in Melbourne. They were cooperative, but there was backbiting. As you guess, <laughs> what's changed? Um, <laughs> this, uh, this particular period in history saw the invention of the Clark, um, was headed by an, a bloke called Auguste Levasseur, who organised the applause, <coughs> and in fact singers paid him. Uh, but the interesting thing about the, the Paris Opera, and we come back to this notion of the mirror, um, uh, the mirror and the window. It was a mirror of history and a mirror of society. It was financed largely by the Society for the Improvement of Breeding of Horses in France, <laughs> otherwise known as the Parisian Jockey Club, who all had their mistresses in the ballet. That's why all the operas at the, at the, at the opera had to have a ballet. And it had to be after <laughs> interval because they always had dinner first. They'd come in after interval and they'd see the floozies in the ballet um, <laughs> and then they'd probably go backstage and meet them. Um, and that's why the plots of these operas the, the, the dynamics of the relationship with them, the conflict of duty and desire, and Catholicism, and the confessional in Madeleine, for sure. I mean, it, it's such a mirror of the sensibility of 19th century France. And this saw the emergence of an extraordinary gentleman, Eugène Scribe, um, who was like a Hollywood hack. He wrote hundreds of libretti. He wrote the, the Sicilian Vespers, L'Africain, God knows how many. And he was the founder of the well-made play. And he churned out this stuff relentlessly. Uh, and it spread, the, these stories spread all over Europe and were set by many, many composers. It was, the house was a mirror in a very complex way of the world which sustained it uh, and which it reflected. So our last snapshot is to look at Australia and what we're trying to do here, to look at what might be, what can be, uh, and perhaps what should be. And no other age in history, I think, has the new face stuff such stiff competition. You see, recording has meant the death of the singularity of performance. Because we can access performance in real time. Any, anyway, you just put it on, you zoosh forward, you go back, you can do it. You could never do that before. You either have to play it, sing it, or listen to it in real time. So it's the death of any, you could access by video now any opera, pretty well in the, well, not everything in the repertoire, but a hell of a lot of it, at a very good level. Of course, what's happened? Recording industry subsequently died um, because of economic, various economic forces. Um, despite the fact that it saw the, the creation of a new generation of superstars like uh, uh, Alania and Giorgio, the, otherwise known as the Ceausescus, who were so horrible that, um, in fact, you know, those two tours to Australia by those two were absolute disgraces in my view. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, overfed, overpaid and over here. <laughs> And now we have an 
Tread Grand Villa Tson has just had a nervous breakdown. And I mean, the impossible demands are placed on these people. Music was never meant to be like this. It's crazy. And as in all times, we've had the voices of the past deified as against the voices of the present. And you know, uh, uh, you, you find that uh, Dr. Bartolo doing that in the Barber of Seville. Um, but this, this kind of instant availability, uh, everybody knows what's happened in Melbourne. They know it tomorrow. Um, you know, our operas, our performances, a lot of them go on the Opera Europa platform. They're seen by um, people in North America and Europe. Um, it's um, simultaneous. I, another word from it, syncretistic universalism. Everything is available at the flick of a switch. The entire history of, of, of Western music is available almost by the press of a button, which makes it really difficult for composer to utter something new in this incredibly com crowded context. It creates um, another challenge. I think a very interesting one, and not necessarily one that's insuperable, because coming back to what I said before about Joseph Conrad, the value of a sentence is, for sentence is in the personality which utters it because he goes on. Nothing new can be said by man or woman. Opera, the most multimedia of art forms, has survived into a multimedia media age. The composite forms of communication are everywhere. What are some possibilities for the future? Well, it seems to me that the intersection of European and non-European and the significance of demographic bases in our cities simply can't be ignored. It is a fact of life. And some things about the linguistics of opera are going to have to change again. A new synthesis, perhaps? Uh, an opera written by an Indian? Uh, an opera uh, using uh, folkloric instruments from other parts of the world? Electronics? Various ways of treating sound in the past and present? There's a rich palette of possibilities. Different fusions of the classic and the popular are also possible. The notion of classical and popular was unknown in Mozart's day. Music was simply music. John Adams has also said that there's plenty of good music to be written in C major. Well, what will the music dramas of the 2050s and 2060s be about? Migration, climate change, outer space? Maybe we'll, we'll still love and value the traditional opera sung by vulnerable human beings. Because it's that element of risk in any opera performance. Will she get there? Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. you know. um, uh, or, oh, never mind. Better like this. <laughs> <laughs> but there are, still, there are still some constants. The art of singing, I think, while we're human, will always have a particular attraction because each voice is a singularity, perhaps one of the few remaining singularities in music where orchestras most of them. It used to, you could turn on the radio and you could tell a Czech orchestra or a French orchestra or the brightness of the Chicago Symphony or the Vienna Philharmonic. Now it's much harder because the standardization of instrument manufacturer, manufacturing and, and schools of playing. The art of singing, however, because of the capacity of the singular individual to inspire and invoke sympathy, I think, and emotion, will still survive as something of value. The first for ritual is a constant in humanity, and that isn't going to die. We need these rituals, these, these communally shared experience of trying to encounter the sublime to make us fully human. Allied to that is the fascination of sonography. We need transport. We need to inhabit imaginative realms. No one goes to the opera to see someone wash up. Uh, <laughs> it has to be um, something of iconic and, and transformative nature. It has to make a revelation. And there is the corresponding need for interest in the parallel textualities of musical invention. The ability to transport and, and inspire and give the gift of a vital and exuberant beauty. A mirror on the complexities of our humanity, if you like, becomes a window on the marvellous. Thank you for listening.
it's so wonderful to hear such a learned um, voice uh, talking about these matters and actually sitting at the piano. I think we've got a recording of that sonata for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering in 2060 whether we would be watching an, op uh, an, an opera about Trump. But um, <laughs> I just wonder whether it'll be a, a tragedy or an opera book. <laughs> Um, it's wonderful to have you back here again. Another wonderful discussion of the issues surrounding opera. This is a, 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 a terrific um, lecture tonight and another terrific series in Calgary. Thank you. Series, sorry. I've had a wonderful 15 years of my life in this wonderful city. And the warmth uh, and support of so many of you, I can't really see your faces because I've got my glasses on and it's dark, but I, I see some faces I know. Uh, and the warmth and support that I enjoyed here was eight years. West Australian Opera, the wonderful working relationship I had with dear Carol and, and dear Craig um, uh, uh, and, and many of you in the chorus uh, were very special. I'll never forget them, a little treasure in the heart. <laughs>